Hi, everybody. Um, I was just saying to Fernanda how grateful I am that she's giving me the introduction because it always feels awkward introducing yourself. Um, it's a pleasure to speak to you today about satellite analytics. Um, I was thinking about how I'm going to start this, this talk. The one thing that struck me, satellite analytics is actually not the full picture. Um, it's much more than that. So satellites are just a part of the things that Kairos do. Um, so I would better call it satellite-based data fusion analytics. Um, I think that makes it a little bit more precise. Um, and I will tell you in this talk mostly around use cases about how we create value for industry, finance, and governments um, to make it a little bit more, let's say, practical rather than theoretical. Um, just quickly about Kairos. Um, we currently count 150 employees across six offices in the world. Yes, you're right, there's no office in Berlin so far. I'm working on it, um, and hopefully we'll be calling this home soon. Um, our key industries, as I said, also include energy. So not just industry, but also energy companies. But in Germany, I would prefer to call it industry since you know, we don't have big energy majors here, um, you know, internationally speaking. Um, we are still VC-backed, so we're still a, a startup, we're still growing. Um, and as you can tell, I included the PhD and MSc number in there. They're very scientific driven, um, very driven by scientific excellence. And you will see in a second why that is very important to us and how that is a key differentiator. Um, and our company exists so far since seven years. Now, about our mission, some of you actually might have heard or read about Kairos already. Um, since we regularly feature in the biggest newspapers in the world, um, mostly about our emissions detection technology, so where we can really see the emissions at an asset level, where we know the company, so we know the owner of methane and CO2 emissions. Um, and we have been basically busting governments and big energy companies worldwide to do a better job and you know, not polluting the planet. And recently, just last week, um, we have been announced one of the most hundred influential companies by Time magazines in the world. Um, so that was a huge achievement for us. Um, and hopefully in a second you get to understand of why it is and how we potentially, or why we deserve that. Um, but yeah, back to the missions. The first mission, I just talked about it quickly, is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That is specifically methane, CO2, but um, also NO2. Um, our main focus and the one we are most known for is, as I said, methane. Um, and the second mission is to protect people ecosystems and assets. Um, I will tell you again in a second how that works. Essentially what we do is we come up with physical risk models. So we can tell, we can predict, we can live monitor and we can evaluate damages to people, homes, um, ecosystems all around the world, um, wherever you want in a very, very sort of um, precise manner. And last but not least, we help the world to manage the energy transition. So we work with the big governments, the big regulators, the big energy companies, um, but also finance to accelerate what is needed since we both monitor the emissions. So we know, you know, kind of the damage that's being done, but we also monitor the solutions, namely renewables, um, solar panels, wind. Um, so we find, you know, at scale of where we stand when it comes to, you know, achieving the 1.5 degree goal. Um, yeah, so that's broadly speaking. Now, before I go into the use cases and tell you a little bit more of how we actually work, um, our key differentiators, I think, are always interesting. I don't know, maybe some of you work in geospatial, um, so you probably don't want to hear this one, uh, but if you don't work in geospatial, but you, you know, heard of it, um, there's a couple of big German companies um, that are pretty good in this field. Our differentiators that are you know, unique worldwide and also what ultimately made us, gave us the honor by the Time magazine is that we have the largest global um, asset base when it comes to energy assets, forests, buildings like Walmarts in North Dakota to the, the coal plant in, uh, in Zindelfing. Um, everything is mapped on our world, so basically you have to imagine like a, a Google Earth and no matter what kind of asset you're interested in, you click on that asset and a dashboard pops up. And depending on the various metrics that you bought, so emissions or um, industrial activity output, so we can tell you what is the production level of that 
you know, energy plant, for example, um, or the physical risks. Well, what, so what's your exposure to wildfire, to, to floods, to dry rivers in Germany, for example, is a big issue. All these things can be then found on the dashboard. So it's kind of like a Google Earth on steroids um, for industry, finance, and governments. Then secondly, as I said, we are very proud and focused on high science. Um, so we employ some of the best of the best when it comes to data analytics and um, remote sensing, it's called. The ones that really crack the code of you know, deciphering the satellite imagery that you pull from public and private satellites. We don't own our own satellites. I think that's important to mention. We just have access to yeah, most of them. Um, and they're really the best when it comes to making raw satellite imagery something intelligible, something that is important to the end user. Um, and we are very flexible when it comes to building solutions. So we're not just building our data and pretend that everybody needs it. We are also talking to you know, the, big, the big players and they kind of tell us what they would like to, what they would like to do. And um, I would say nine out of 10 times we are able to, to pull it off um, in a very great way. And then I already kind of mentioned it. We pursue this source agnostic model. Um, so compared to our competitors, typically they run their own satellite fleet um, and they have their own kind of data inputs. But we, we work with, as I said, the ESA, NASA, but also private companies like Planet, if you've heard of them. Um, and what that allows us is that we don't have to pay for, these, for that hardware. So you know, competitive pricing, we can put it into research and development of our codes. Um, and it allows us to be very kind of flexible when it comes to building solutions for, for our clients. Now, the first use case, it's my favorite one, um, which is why I want to start with it. Um, and also, I'm going to try and speed up a little bit. So in the end, if there are any questions, maybe we can have one or two. If not, please maybe see me after. Um, right. So on greenhouse gas emissions, we can detect and quantify greenhouse gas emissions and attribute it to the owner. So let's start with methane, for example. We work with so-called hyperspectral imagery, and you kind of have to imagine like a rainbow band layered across the world. And our coders, they're able to detect sort of the extreme concentrated um, variations in those, you know, normal, you know, methane is everywhere, but if there is an extreme concentration somewhere, that pops up on our screen. And we are able to look at that asset, as you can see in the photo, and can build the plume. Um, and that has a 20 meter resolution. So even in an area where you know, there's coal and gas facilities lined up every 50 meters, like in Texas, we can really differentiate, does that belong to ConocoPhillips, ExxonMobil, Total Energy, you name it. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's really cool. What we have now built, and talking about the value for finance, for example, we have built benchmarks where we compare not just the, the actual emissions between those oil and gas majors, which is very important in the United States, for example, where now, in the end of the year, um, methane emissions come at a price. So you have to pay $900 per kilogram ton um, of methane. Um, and we see some of these facilities in Pennsylvania, for example, we saw one facility that was leaking 200, um, 200 tons an hour. So if you calculate that, I did it earlier on the metro, it's around um, 100 and 180 million liability, financial liability, in the span of a week. So for those oil and gas majors, it might be peanuts, but for the finance guys, you know, they will have a different look. So private equity is looking at it. Do we invest in this company? Do we invest in that company? Asset managers are structuring the portfolios with best in class, um, but also investment bankers advising their clients. They look at this data now, um, since obviously it comes at a financial risk, but also with a reputational risk. We also work with the governments, so the regulators that put the price cap on this, and they use our methodology to hold these companies accountable. And we also work with the United Nations in this field um, the the um, environmental program that are making this data public three months after the first detection um, and giving those oil and gas majors the time to close those leaks um, until they publish their names. What's important, and this is, and then I will move on, it's that we know for a fact that 50% of all these methane emissions can be closed at zero cost, actually at 
at, at, with revenue because this is all perfectly well marketable gas and oil that is just being you know vented and flared into the air um, can can yeah can be cut at zero cost within the next two years. So it's arguably the lowest hanging fruit when it comes to climate change in the world right now, which is why I mentioned in the beginning all the media and magazines are currently looking at this, and the European Union, for example, is now also looking at methane and how companies have to pay a tax on it when they import methane into European borders. So, yeah, it's a very important, um, let's call it, emission. Now, on CO2, I'm going to keep brief so I can run another few slides. On CO2, it's a little bit different. We don't measure, so we can't differentiate molecule from molecule but we have the best possible estimates. It's currently impossible for anybody to measure CO2 by satellites, um, but we have a 98.7 accuracy to estimate the CO2 emissions at asset level. So this is a very non-discriminatory and um, random example, but technically we could come up with a good estimate of what is the emissions of RWE or Heidelberg cement worldwide, um, and could you know, give that data to the company, but also to finance and government um, so yeah, it's, it's also quite an interesting use case. Now, the second one is we can evaluate physical risks of asset and ecosystems. I, I told you in the beginning. Um, on the left side, you see a, a flood model in, in Japan where we have sort of layered our methodology and our pictures essentially over the city of Kurume giving a good picture of which house has been flooded, which house has been maybe avoided, which field in yellow has been affected. Um, and that data is obviously very important for insurance. This is an evaluation of a damage, so after the crisis has happened. On the right side, this is for wildfire in all of states, we give you a forecast. So we can tell you what is the risk score, simply speaking, from 1 to 10. It's more complex than that, um, based on 28 different parameters um, of a Walmart or of a government building or of a school, no matter in, in, in the United States. Um, and here we're working with the public sector, also with insurance, so they can design their underwriting in a more efficient way. But it's also interesting what we learn to normal industry companies and also finance that obviously want to avoid you know, financial costs attached to natural hazards. And we can see it in, in, uh, in Germany, and last week at uh, Markus Lanz, there was a big contribution about it on how you know, fire hazard is a problem in Germany year-round now. Um, so hopefully we, are we can find a couple of companies that are interested in this to avoid financial cost. Um, then this is maybe my second new favorite one. Um, I don't know who of you has heard about the EU anti-deforestation law or regulation. Um, which essentially means that European companies in the future or very soon have to now make sure that the products that they sell in Europe and the direct and indirect suppliers that they work with don't have no association with deforestation whatsoever. What we can do with satellites is we can fly over your supplier and we can not just give you a screenshot of what's currently happening, but we can also give you a historical analysis of what has been happening since the last six years. And not only can we tell you there is a difference, we can quantify the level of biodiversity that has happened because we can differentiate species from species um, based on machine learning and, 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 um, yeah, and uh, um, yeah, AI, essentially. So we can differentiate between soil, um, soil plants, we can even detect cocaine plantations, um, everything that you can possibly be interested in we can show you, has it been lost? Has it been advancing? Has it come at a cost? Um, was it declared or not? And based on that, you can do your you know, supply chain due diligence reporting in an independent, transparent way that actually is believable to both the consumer and the regulator. And um, yeah. Now, there's a bit of a different use case, um, talking about deforestation and land use. We, um, here is forest, but I could have also put in a, a mine, for example. We can look, this is about biodiversity, not on supply chains per se. We can check that the investment that you made, for example, in, a, in an open bit mine for lithium, for example. Um, typically, you know, mines expand and that comes again at a cost of biodiversity. And now with ESG reporting, it's very important that you have an idea of what that biodiversity impact is. 
but there is this thing called double materiality where it's not just what is your impact on nature, but what is nature's impact on yours? And all of these things we can now see by satellites worldwide. So it's, I think, from what I know, satellite um, technology is the only way where you can monitor these things at scale across all your facilities. Um, so if you talk about a company like BMW, for example, um, they have suppliers or maybe own investments in South Africa, Algeria, um, Brazil, um, and instead of sending people there with clipboards and taking handwritten notes, where everybody knows it's going to be bullshit, sorry the language, um, you might as well just look at it with, with a satellite. Um, then, talking about the voluntary carbon market, we see both sides of the coin. So I told you earlier that we can measure, well, with 98.7% accuracy, detect CO2 emissions. And what we do is we aggregate that for all the sectors that are captured by the European um, emissions trading scheme. So that is, I think it's steel, it's energy, it's you know, all these different sectors. We aggregate those emissions of all the different facilities. And we have a perfectly fine um, idea of what is the physical demand for CO2 certificates in the European Union. Because the amount of, the amount of CO2 that's being emitted creates demand for CO2 certificates. So we work with finance and traders that bet on these certificates to buy and sell them at the ideal price. Um, and hopefully we can also work with the emitter themselves um, to avoid costs and getting ripped off by these traders. Um, but what you also see, and obviously here you don't see emissions, you see a forest, um, we, can, we can detect the level of carbon sequestration of your investment. So if you're a company and you invest, invest in a forest in Brazil to offset your car fleet, for example, you want to know which forest that you buy actually gives you the most value for your money. Um, and so what we do is, and you can see it in the shaded dark green, um, we can, by differentiating between trees, by looking at tree height, by looking even at chlorophyll, um, yeah, chloroph uh, chlorophyll, I think it's called, um, we can have all these different measurements to come up with the idea of how much CO2 is actually stored in the few hectares that you're going to buy and what, how much CO2 can you buy in the, in the lot next door. On top of that, we can also detect, and you see it in a little bit in red, um, is there any deforestation happening around there? Do you have to tell your developer, your partner, that there's something wrong, that you have to intervene? So all these different metrics come into place to overcome what we call a crisis of confidence that surrounds these projects because typically they're exposed to greenwashing allegations. You've seen it maybe in the news. Vera, um, also Climate Partners, um, South Pole, they've all been lately um, in the critique, which is a terrible problem because this is an incredible and a great tool to protect our forest and to put the money where it's needed. Um, but you just need to have the monitoring devices to make sure it's good. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how we basically help companies um, on, the, on the voluntary, but also on the compliance carbon market. Then, this is my last slide. I think a lot of people might be interested in ESG and how can this possibly help us be more efficient or you know, more clear when it comes to reporting. What we kind of help with is the, the so-called LEAP methodology that is based on locate, evaluate, assess and prepare. Um, and this is a recognized methodology by, by the regulators whereby you can you know, design your ESG reporting. And I think if you look at the, diff the four different pillars, it's quite clear of, after having seen those use cases of how satellite intelligence, what we call environmental intelligence, um, can help you, you know, do this at scale and quickly. And so obviously we can locate where your asset is and what is your interface with nature. I talked about this, for example, with the mines and the double materiality. We can evaluate. Um, we can, as I said, with emissions, for example, we can assess nature-related risk for your business. That's what I talked about, for example, with the physical risk and the wildfire and the floods. And we can prepare. So taking all these LEA into consideration, with P, you can now come up with action plans. And we even give you simulation models for some reason that can tell you if X happens, Y will happen. Um, and you can then see, okay, if you're just here, if you're just there, if we do this, um, we can actually come out better and as a leader in, in our industry when it comes to ESG. And I hope 
that is the expectation and the motivation of all the leading companies um, in, a, in a country like Germany. Having said that, I think just on time. Um, I hope you have a lot of questions. If you do, please find me outside. Um, and I hope you learned something about satellite analytics. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Niklas. Um, we have a bit of time. Shall we see if we, there uh, are any sure. questions? Um, so if you have a question or a comment, um, please raise your hand. So sorry, I'm, the light is right on my face. <laughs> so we can see, bring a mic to you. So anyone? Don't be shy. Here, uh, Andy, can you? Sorry, I, I missed. Uh, the initial part of the presentation, so maybe it's not relevant, yeah. but I was wondering whether you um, you are actively buying uh, ESG or climate data from third party sources in order to integrate them into your services. Thanks. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, no, we, we don't buy any other third party data um, for emissions or nothing. It's nothing that we, we do. We do. We create our own data. Um, and we see the value in what we do is by being completely independent in, you know, independence when it comes to reporting is important because if we look at what is already being reported based on third party data, it's, um, again, sorry to say, quite bullshit. Um, when it comes to emissions, we see a times 20 difference between what's reported and what's actually happening when it comes to emissions. So we don't rely on that, no. I'm wondering if uh, companies have caught up with, you know, the fact that they're being monitored in this way and if there's any sophisticated attempts by corporations to um, kind of fudge the emissions that you calculate based on the satellite mm. through, I don't know, routing it in some way or do you have to um, counter that, those efforts? Um, again, great question. So, yeah, obviously we face a lot of, a lot of lobbyism when we speak to regulators. Um, so I mentioned the European Union, but also the US. Um, obviously, you def we find a lot of people that hate what we do. But um, I think they came to the conclusion that it's all, you know, it's all pen on paper, it's all, it's all settled, and it's all in the legislation now. Um, and they're now actually trying to collaborate with us. So they're increasingly becoming clients. And our goal is always regulation creates demand. So we push for regulation first, and then they will come. If you would push mm -hmm. demand and then regulation, it wouldn't work. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the way we play it to, you know, overcome that problem. Yeah. Okay, we have time for one more question. No? Ah, there. Sorry. Hello. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. Uh, hyperspectral satellite imagery is really widely used right now in the agriculture industry. So I was wondering if, uh, Karius, uh, you're using uh, th this type of data and analysis in such an industry uh, for carbon sequestration, mm. uh, water resource management, disease p prediction, things like that. Yeah, so um, short answer, no. We don't count the agriculture sector as a client or as an audience. Um, there is a lot of competition around this one, um, and it's nothing that we focus on. Um, our hyperspectral imagery is typically used for emissions, um, but yeah, maybe in the future. But as of now, we see our priorities elsewhere. Great, thank you so much, Niklas. Thank you. And uh, I'm sure you'll be maybe around for the day if you also like maybe want to find him around Hub. Um, Feel free so. Thank you so much. Thank you.